Hi, this is Mercedes Byrne Klug. I'm with the University of Iowa in the School of Social Work, and today's topic is grief after the diagnosis of dementia. Um, here's a disclosure statement that indicates that I have no disclosures, but I wanted just to make sure that I included that. These are two images that I'd like you to bear in mind. I'll explain what the images represent a little bit later on in the presentation, and then we'll also close with these images. But if you're, as you think about this presentation, um, I think it's helpful to have a couple images in mind. And so I'm just going to plant the seed right now and have you wonder just a little bit about what these images represent. And then we'll talk about it as part of the presentation. All right, let's talk a little bit about the objectives for today's session. First of all, we'll start out by defining dementia and then going on to defining grief, talking about some of the grief-related terms that you hear about in the literature, um, and then it, really we're going to focus on discussing the experience of grief within the context of dementia. So after the person's been diagnosed with dementia, we're going to talk about grief then, so between the time of diagnosis and before the death. And that's what's going to make this presentation a little bit different than some other presentations you may have um, listened to related to grief. We're not talking about grief experienced after the death. We're really focusing with this presentation on the grief experienced between the diagnosis and then right before the death. We'll conclude um, by sharing some resources for healthcare practitioners. I'm assuming that there are healthcare practitioners from different disciplines listening, so it's going to be a kind of a broad approach to talking about grief after a diagnosis of dementia, and also that you're going to be in a lot of different healthcare settings. So those of you who are counselors or therapists and work with people related to grief issues, this is going to be like a little primer. Um, it's not going to go into depth in terms of therapeutic interventions. I'm assuming that most of the people who are listening to this work in a clinical setting. They're seeing patients. They don't have a whole lot of time. Um, they're either outpatient, probably. And so the main purpose of your interaction with the family is, and the person with dementia is not a therapeutic purpose about talking about grief. So this is just about how do you bring up grief, how do you recognize grief, and what might you be able to do to help refer the patient and the family to other resources. So in other words, it's a basic overview. All right, let's start by defining dementia. Dementia is a general term for a decline in mental ability, and this decline is severe enough to interfere with daily life. Memory loss is an example. This is a very, very basic layperson's definition of dementia. It doesn't get into the pathophysiology of dementia, but just to make sure that we are using language that our um, non-medical people will be able to follow. And so when you talk about dementia, especially if someone's just being diagnosed, you want to start out with a very basic, broad definition and then layer onto that more information that's going to be more specific. When we're talking about dementia, um, at least two of the following core mental functions must be significantly impaired in order for a person to be considered to have dementia. Memory, and that's what most lay people associate with having dementia. Changes in memory, declines in memory, memory disturbances. Their communication and language is impaired and interfered. So people have trouble communicating, expressing themselves, carrying on a conversation, following a conversation, um, and that really affects social interactions. And then also the ability to focus and pay attention. People have a hard time staying on task. Um, they may not remember what they've been doing. They And so that ends up having lots of 
issues in terms of social interactions as well, because until the diagnosis is made, there can be a lot of misunderstandings among persons having these symptoms with other people who recognize the change but are just wondering, you know, what's going on. You'll also see changes in reasoning and judgment. These are the changes that are particularly important to discuss with the person diagnosed with dementia and with the family because it's going to affect a person's ability to drive safely and use large appliances safely and all sorts of other things, make legal documents, things like that. So um, recognizing that there will be changes in reasoning and in judgment coming down the pike after a diagnosis of dementia should set some things in in order for the family and the person with dementia to start getting um, some things lined up. Also some visual perception changes. This information is from the Alzheimer's Association's website. It's a very good website for you to refer families to. There's a lot of information there and it's written between a sixth and an eighth grade level so it's accessible. The Alzheimer's Association has also printed a 37 page article in a journal article that was published in 2011 that talks about the state of Alzheimer's um, here in the United States and reports data at the state level and all that. It'll be on your reference sheet that accompanies this presentation. Now I got a little bit ahead of myself focusing on Alzheimer's disease because Alzheimer's is just one type of dementia. Dementia is not a specific disease. It's a cluster of symptoms and there are many different kinds of diseases that are considered to be types of dementia. I have Alzheimer's disease printed in yellow because it's the most common cause of dementia um, and there's a lot of resources about Alzheimer's disease and that's the term that most people, most lay people are familiar with but it's important to remember that it isn't the only type of dementia. So we can think of dementia as the umbrella term and then all of these different types of diseases falling underneath that umbrella term. On the left you see um, a resident in a nursing home who has dementia, um, able to interact with the staff, able to ambulate. You see he has a wander guard at his wrist so that if he goes out the door there'll be an alarm. He's in the p place where he's not really sure where he is. Um, he recognizes his wife and his grandchildren and they um, visit frequently. In fact his wife is there every day and then when she leaves he goes through some anxiety because in many ways she represents home to him so as long as he's with her he feels safe and he's able to relax himself with him and enjoy things when she leaves there's a period of adjustment every single day as um, he goes and seeks out staff for reinsurance about yes he's supposed to be there yes his wife knows that he's there yes the wife his wife will be coming back to visit yes she was there lots of reassurance and so um, he has a special relationship with this staff member who's able to put him at ease tell him what he needs to hear and then she's also used to having him follow her around sometimes as she makes her rounds because he's not comfortable being alone the woman on the right, the lower right, also has dementia. She is much further along in the process of dementia. She uh, needs assistance in getting out of bed, getting into a wheelchair, getting transferring into this chair. She spends most of her time in bed. In fact, when I saw her sitting at the dining table, I was really surprised because most of the time when I have seen this woman and visited with her, she was horizontal laying in bed. And most of the time when her family comes to visit, she's also laying in bed. And so to actually see her sitting up um, and engaged in eating was, was good to see. Not able to carry a conversation. I'm not sure if she recognizes her family members and is really inside of herself in terms of her awareness of her environment.
and um, the family has had to adjust. They continue to come and see her, make sure that she's doing okay, but there isn't a whole lot of communication between she and her family because she doesn't have the capacity to communicate verbally. There's some hand-holding, there's some uh, stroking of the shoulder, things like that, a reassuring presence, um, but for the most part, she she's not able to verbalize, vocalize uh, what she's feeling um, or carry on a conversation. All right, we talked about dementia being a series of symptoms and that there are many different types of dementia and many different causes of dementia. I want to talk about what's called the FAST, which is a functional assessment staging of dementia tool. And it was developed by Riesberg in 1988, and it's been used by a lot of people since then. And what it does is it just gives some very broad categories of dementia based on function. And so for family members or people who don't have a medical background, it's much easier for them to understand kind of a behavioral or functional staging of dementia than getting into all the details of the pathophysiology. And so they use statuses from one to seven. The higher the number, the more severe the dementia. Um, they're talking about dementia of the Alzheimer's type. And so you can see, like for number two, the person is still considered more or less a normal older adult. There are uh, some awareness of some functional decline. And then the next stage is early Alzheimer's, noticeable deficits in demanding job situations if the person is still in the workforce or whatever their usual roles are, that they're having some issues uh, fulfilling role expectations. Mild Alzheimer's, so if they're working on complicated tasks, they definitely need some assistance. Into five, we're talking about moderate Alzheimer's. Um, an example of somebody with moderate Alzheimer's needs is actually having somebody help them decide what to wear or what's appropriate to wear. Moderate, number six, severe Alzheimer's, that's when a person needs assistance with the daily activities and is um, generally incontinent, not, not able to control bowel and bladder. And then number seven, severe Alzheimer's disease, progressive loss of walking, progressive loss of sitting up, of smiling, of holding the head up, of speaking. I'm just showing you here these main seven stages, but Riesberg and colleagues also have sub-stages to give a little bit more detail. So if you're talking with family members um, at some point, they, they might find that useful to see it in kind of a functional characteristics. All right, now let's turn our attention to the concept of grief, which is really the main concept of today's presentation. I just wanted to give you that background of dementia. And then a little bit later on, we're going to kind of braid together the concepts of dementia and the concepts of grief. The first thing I need to say is that grief is a natural reaction to loss. It's natural. It's normal. Um, and so when a person experiences a profound loss, and that includes death of a loved one, but other losses can result in grief as well. So when we're talking about grief as a natural response or a natural reaction to loss, we are not limiting grief to people who have had a loved one die. This is a big difference than how most people think about grief, most lay people. We're recognizing as we work with people with dementia and families of people with dementia that there are many losses before the death and that these losses, a natural response to these losses by both the person who has the diagnosis of dementia and their family or friends, a natural response to those losses is grief. Grief is a normal, psychological, social, and physical reaction to loss. I got that from page 8 of Nancy Hueyman and Betty Kramer's book. The citation's a little bit lower on the slide. Um, 
Some of the readings will say grief is a psychological process. Actually, uh, most people are coming to recognize it's much broader than psychological. It's also social and physical reaction to loss. And Nancy Huyman and Betty Kramer in their book, Living Through Loss, say that the term is generally, you know, we're talking about grief and loss, but they're suggesting we think just the opposite, loss and grief. That loss happens first, and then grief is that natural reaction to loss. And again, the main point here is it can be any kind of serious loss. The literature on grief has taken the general concept of grief and partitioned it into different kinds of grief. And so there are many different kinds of grief or concepts related to grief that could be useful. And depending on what kind of a setting you're in or what kind of a clients or patients you work with, you might want to get a little bit more familiar with the different, the top three different kinds of grief because I'm not going to be talking much about them today. Let's just review them quickly though. Anticipatory grief is that recognizing that there's going to be a loss coming and anticipating that loss and then going through some of these natural reactions to that loss. Disenfranchised grief is a concept proposed by Ken Doka and it's grief that people experience but the loss that triggered that grief is not recognized by the broader society or not recognized by this person's social support system. So um, some examples of that, let's say you have the loss of somebody who dies with HIV AIDS and you're in uh, a city or a state or a country where there's a lot of stigma associated with that diagnosis. So that death may not be, the, the grief that's experienced from the person surviving may not receive the same kind of support, social support, that that person would have received had their loved one died from a different cause. Um, it also speaks to the kind of grief that happens if the person experiencing the grief isn't recognized as a quote-unquote appropriate person to be experiencing grief. What do I mean by that? Let's say you have somebody who's been having an affair for 30 years outside of marriage and that person dies. Well, the person who they were having the affair with, their grief is not going to be recognized by society in part because people may not have even known about that relationship or if they had known, there's not going to be the same kind of support. Um, pathological grief we're not going to talk about in this presentation. Um, there's some controversy about using the term pathological grief related to uh, dementia pre-death, um, and that'll be the topic of another presentation. It's this last term, ambiguous loss, that I really want to talk about today because I think it's the most useful of these grief-related concepts in terms of working with persons um, after the diagnosis. Oh, I wanted to also say a few other, clarify a few other words that often are used in the same sentence with grief or sometimes used interchangeably with grief. Bereavement is the state of being deprived. Uh, it's usually used to refer after a death has occurred, but it's not exclusively used then. So if you're using bereavement with others, you need to make sure that you're both on the same page in terms of are you talking about somebody has died and and then the state of being without that person or are you talking about a different kind of loss. Mourning is the the social expression of having experienced or suffered the loss and so you're going to see mourning rituals vary um, by society, by culture, by time in history. And then loss is probably the broadest of those terms, and that is you know, being deprived of something um, that you value. And it can take on many, many different forms. 
I wanted to talk about this for a couple reasons. First of all, as you engage in discussions with other health professionals or with family members or with persons who've been recently diagnosed with dementia, make sure that you are very concrete when you use these terms uh, or give examples so that people know what you're talking about. And if people, your patients or clients are using the term like bereavement or feeling like they're in mourning, I would invite you to pursue that, ask some follow-up questions so that you're sure that you understand how they're using those terms because there's a lot of confusion about the use of these four terms, grief, bereavement, mourning, and loss. As we talk about grief in this presentation, we're really focusing on grief as a response to loss, as a normal response to loss. And so when we pair that idea grief with the concept of dementia, um, we're going to recognize there's lots of different kinds of losses. And in the Lundquist chapter in this book that's listed there, it's the book, the overall book is Ethnic Variations in Dying, Death, and Grief, Diversity and Universality. They have different chapters that bring some sensitivity to different cultural groups to build some awareness there. Um, but they start the whole book out by talking about loss and loss in a large, broad sense. And there's an inventory about uh, different kinds of losses that people might be able, that people experience. All of us will experience some of these losses throughout our life. And so I've just summarized the categories of losses that are part of their loss awareness list, but I think it'd be very useful to spend some time going through that. So I've got the list with me here. I'm not going to um, put the whole thing up on the PowerPoint. So when they talk about concrete losses, they're talking about the loss of things like money, the loss of a home, the loss of things that are objective and concrete that you could point to and that people <clears throat> can see. It also includes the loss of a job, as opposed to abstract losses, which they include as loss of dreams, loss of one's faith, loss of one's safe, that the sense that the world's a safe place. Those are abstract losses. Um, in a clinical setting, we're much more likely to engage people in conversations about their concrete losses associated with dementia and a dementia diagnosis. But we often overlook these abstract losses. And so I encourage you to think about that too and, and ask people about those abstract losses. Developmental losses, losses that are associated with the process of aging, and then you couple that with a dementia and you have the acceleration of some of these developmental losses, and they take getting used to as well. The loss of self is a very important loss, and in fact there was a um, popular book about the experience of dementia, and the title of the book was The Loss of Self. Um, fundamental loss recognizing that you're not going to be able to interact with people you love and in roles that you love in the way that you have in the past and that you're going to lose your awareness of that. That's very frightening, very frightening. Um, and then also then the loss of others. So the loss of others through the death of a spouse, a child, a sibling, a close friend, but also the loss of others because if somebody you love is diagnosed with dementia and um, will be progressing with a dementia like an Alzheimer's type which does get progressive uh, then they're going to be experiencing the loss of those relationships as well so let's focus on the concept of ambiguous loss this is a term that was coined by Pauline Boss um, she was at the in Wisconsin, University of Wisconsin, and also has been at the University of Minnesota. Um, she comes at this concept from a psychological perspective originally, but then she's really broadened it as to be a social concept. 
She's got a new book out, published in 2011, Loving Somebody Who Has Dementia, How to Find Hope While Coping with Stress and Grief. I highly recommend this book. I highly recommend that you have this book in your waiting room, that you have your staff read the book, and that you have maybe some copies available when you're interacting with clients and patients. It's very sensitively written and uh, it's got a lot of good and helpful information and it normalizes some of the very um, dramatic changes and feelings that people have about being in this situation about dementia, the absurdity of the situation of dementia, the social absurdity and she has from her um, multi-decade career of working with the concept of ambiguous loss now written this book specific to dementia. So Pauline Voss developed the concept of ambiguous loss a couple decades ago and this book is how she puts it to um, applies her concept of ambiguous ambiguous loss to uh, persons affected by dementia. And this comes back to these photos that I first talked about at the very beginning. Um, on the left you see a, a collection of flowers. I noticed that on the counter in the apartment building where my mom lives. And she lives in an apartment building with many older adults. It's an apartment building for persons with disabilities and persons who are frail. And there on the counter, just as you walk in the front door, was this vase of flowers and then a card underneath the flowers. One of the residents in this apartment building had died the day before, and they announced the death. Of, and then also when the obituary was published, that was put up on the resident bulletin board, the card there was an opportunity for people to sign this card and give the card to her husband who also lives in that apartment building. So it was a couple who was living there and the, and the wife died. And so there was this formal recognition that the death has occurred. People recognize that although all the residents were affected by the loss of this particular person, the husband was tr deeply, deeply affected by the loss. And so that card was part of the ritual of recognizing the loss and expressing some support. She died, I think it was on a Thursday. Um, and on Sunday, I happened to be at the senior center having lunch with my mom. And the senior center is connected to this particular apartment building. And the Sunday was Easter Sunday. And the woman who died uh, had eaten lunch regularly there with her husband at the senior center. And um, so I was there with my mom. And I see the widower walking in. And the people who take your money didn't know that his wife had died and so they were just kind of joking with him very friendly person and he went through and he got his um, tray of food and then he's gonna go sit down and he's usually eating with his wife and she's not there and he goes and sits down alone at a table and some of the other people in the surrounding tables had no idea that his wife had died and so it wasn't recognized. Well, I knew that his wife had died, and so I went over and invited him to come and, and have his lunch with us, and so we were able to have lunch together on his first Easter without his wife. All that was possible because his loss was recognized socially. It was a very concrete loss, and there's some understanding of ritual on how um, people less affected by the loss should treat the persons most affected by the loss. And I think that he benefited from not eating alone that day. I certainly enjoyed having lunch with him. And then also when people, after he left and people came by and said, oh, it was kind of unusual for you guys to have lunch with him what's up? Where's his wife? Then we were able to also talk about that too, which will lead to uh, more support for him. When people are dealing with ambiguous loss, 
they're not going to get a vase of flowers by the front door. They're not going to get somebody else inviting over for coffee. Why? Because the loss that has occurred is shrouded in ambiguity. And it's not really clear like a death has occurred. There's been a major loss. So if your spouse is diagnosed or your mother is diagnosed or your sibling is diagnosed or your close friend diagnosed with dementia, you're not going to get those flowers. You're not going to get that card. Other people don't see the loss, recognize the loss. We don't have the rituals for um, helping people with that loss. And there's no resolution and there's no closure. A person's been diagnosed with dementia, but they're not, they have not died. So it's that interval that's very, very ambiguous. You begin to feel the loss. You probably had felt the loss even before the diagnosis because you've noticed some of the changes. And there's the progression of Alzheimer's, that kind of a dementia, is going to continue. I should say not all dementias are progressive, so it's very important to have a thorough diagnosis when a person is suspected of having dementia because there are um, ways to address or treat some types of dementia. The person with dementia, it's kind of hard to determine, is that person here or are they not here? And this is part of the challenge of people experiencing ambiguous loss. And in the context of dementia, the person is there. Their body is there. They're physically present. But they're emotionally and socially getting further and further away. And the close relationship that the person with dementia has with their social support system is going to be undergoing some really big changes and the person with dementia will not be able to participate in the relationship in the same way they did before. And so that results in big role changes, both for the person with the dementia diagnosis, but also for everybody else in their system. And so people who are experiencing this ambiguous loss in the context of dementia have this confusion about whether the person is there or not there. Yes, they're there physically, but they're not there relationally. So the whole status is very confusing when you have somebody in your life with dementia. Um, and it's a real challenge to find meaning. And it ruptures the relationship that you once had. And so Pauline Boss, in her book, goes through and explains uh, with case examples, each of these different symptoms of ambiguous loss. And when other people read about the experiences that have, uh, others have had and have the language that Pauline Boss has provided us with, it can be very normalizing and very validating for people to recognize they're not completely alone and that somebody understands them. And it also can give the client and their family some words to articulate to explain what they're going through to other persons. So I really highly recommend the book. Um, when someone you love has dementia, the task is to increase your tolerance for the stress of ambiguity. That is one of the key insights of Pauline Boss's work on all sorts of ambiguous loss. She uses the term ambiguous loss to apply to people who are um, lost, maybe missing in action at a war, or somebody who's been kidnapped. All sorts of these situations where you're really not sure is the person there or not there, or are you still in a relationship with this person. It's ambiguous, and these are highly stressful circumstances. And so um, the book that I referred you to is just about ambiguous loss in the context of dementia, but I want to make sure that you understand that this concept, ambiguous loss, is inclusive of dementia, but much broader. And one of the key insights she had, has, regardless of the cause of ambiguous loss, is that what we're hoping for is to help people build their tolerance for their stress of this ambiguity. We cannot necessarily change the situation. We can't undo Alzheimer's. We can't 
undo somebody who's missing in action or the situation where that uh, large plane goes down in the ocean or we're not even sure it went down and did anybody survive and all that kind of stuff. All that ambiguity, highly, highly stressful. And so her approach to working with individuals and families is to name the ambiguity, address it head on, and then develop skills for living your life with this big ambiguity as part of it. Um, her book talks about these are some guidelines that she has specifically for people who are experiencing ambiguous loss within the context of dementia. And again, she goes into much more detail in her book. A big challenge is finding meaning. And it's difficult to find meaning because the situation is absurd. And by absurd, I mean it's so completely not normal, not expected, not what people were planning on, these situations that result in ambiguous loss. And so it feels meaningless. And when we feel like we're stuck in a situation that's meaningless, it can lead to some psychosocial problems. It can lead to sadness, depression, hopelessness, fear. And so Pauline Boss suggests that one of the ways to build your capacity to cope with this ambiguity is to find some meaning or to assign some meaning. Balancing, working with people to balance control with acceptance. Our uh, U.S. society, we're pretty much uh, into control. We like to plan. We like to get things done. We like to feel that we have power over our lives. You're in a situation with an ambiguous loss with dementia where you don't have that kind of control anymore. And in fact, I had somebody who came to my support group for a couple of years. He um, had spent 50 years with his wife, and he was in the Foreign Service, so actually they were in the Foreign Service. Because back in the day, if you were the wife of somebody who was in the Foreign Service, you had an unrecognized but still full-time job of entertaining, welcoming guests, and helping your spouse go up the ladder. So they had lived all over the world. They'd raised children. They were a couple um, who truly enjoyed each other. And she was di diagnosed with dementia, and he just had a very difficult time dealing with all the things that were no longer under his control. And it was not the retirement that they had expected. And he came up with his famous uh, favorite tagline that he would bring up at least once per support group session, I've just got to learn how to expect the unexpected. And that's how he put some parameters around this control that if he recognized that he wasn't going to have control, he wasn't going to be able to expect everything that was going to happen. So if he would expect the unexpected, ironically, that gave him back a little sense of control. Um, the other item that Pauline Boss discusses is broadening your identity. And she talks about the ambiguous loss in dementia, so many social implications of this. So first of all, Generally, you lose the relationship with somebody very important to you, and that's a huge loss. But they're still there, and you probably now have your role changed to, ha to be of assistance to this person. And the further into the dementia that the person becomes, the less able they are to function independently, which means that somebody else needs to be doing that. And so what happens to many people, and I've seen this through many years of um, coordinating support groups, is that as the person's dementia progresses, the caregiver's life gets smaller and smaller and smaller. They, they have a shorter leash. They're not able to do the kinds of things that they would do to relieve their stress and relieve the sense of loss because they are now really the ears and eyes and in many cases the brain of the person who's affected most directly by the dementia diagnosis. So one of the things that Pauline Boss talks about is try to resist this narrowing of your life and broaden your identity. And one important way of doing that is being around other people who are dealing with dementia.
um, dealing with caregiving with dementia. A support group is one approach. Uh, people are uh, doing all sorts of things um, akin to a support group, but not called a support group. So there might be like a book club or a coffee clatch where the person with dementia might also be welcome because otherwise you've got the issue of who's going to care for this person if the caregiver's gone. But it's trying to develop those social connections with people who understand and who can support what you're going through and who will acknowledge that and also to try to, to prevent the isolation. The isolation is a very difficult problem with uh, dementia caregivers. Um, the issue of managing your mixed emotions lots of mixed emotions in any context with ambiguous loss. Um, wishing the situation wasn't this way, wanting to be the best caregiver you can be, wanting this whole thing to be over all at once, um, and a lot of mixed emotions. And so being able to name those and label them and articulate them and have them accepted and realize that it's normal, those are all important things that people going through this experience would benefit from. Uh, Boss talks a lot about holding on and letting go, but deciding what you hold on to and what you let go of. So back to my um, support group member who was with the Foreign Service, it, the retirement wasn't what he had planned at all, and he was a planner. He had a really hard time making the changes. Um, yet, he did find ways to hold on to part of what he wanted to do. He wanted to continue traveling in retirement, and so he was able to set up to have the children come in and stay with his wife so that he could still go away on weekends, and he still occasionally got together with other people from the Foreign Service and networked and he found that was really allowed him to continue as a caregiver much longer because he got some respite and he got some breaks. Lots of work on imagining new hopes and dreams. This isn't the life you thought you were going to have. This isn't the life you thought your loved one was going to have. But how can you take this situation and develop some dreams and goals and hopes within this context and then you know taking care of yourself as well so what i'd like you to do is now put these two ideas together the functional assessment staging of dementia these stages of dementia and the loss inventory and i'd like you to do this on your own you can stop this if you'd like but i'd like you to recognize and name some specific losses that are going to be commensurate with the different stages that you could actually anticipate so that when you work with clients and patients you are really thinking down to the level of these stages about the specific kinds of losses that um, would not be unexpected for the person with the diagnosis and for the person with um, the caregiver. If you are doing an in-service with staff, this might be an exercise you could do as well in a nursing home setting or in some kind of another in-service setting. So if we take this one step further and we go into the specific types of loss at each of those stages, the next step is to think about, well, what might this mean for the patient and what might this mean for the family? Because the patient and the family might have the same type of loss, but they're going to be experiencing it very differently because their role is very different. And so actually, and I suggest doing this even in support groups, maybe taking one type of loss and then talking about it among the caregivers, or if you're doing an early diagnosis support group, talking about it with the people who've been recently diagnosed, it, it, the exercise can be very helpful for people to recognize that what they're going through, as unpredictable as it is, there still is some kind of method to the madness. That as the, these different kinds of losses are experienced, that uh, we can anticipate the effects on the person with diagnosis and the caregiver. I want to also share with you um, this caregiver grief inventory. It was developed for people who are caregivers of somebody with a progressive form of dementia, so with a dementia that's going to get worse. They have a long form and they have a short form. 
What we have in front is part of the short form in front of you, and this is also part of the handouts that go along with this. I wanted to give you some idea of what these specific items are because this can actually help you better understand what people are going through if you haven't had somebody in your own family with dementia or if you haven't been a caregiver. The authors, Marwick and Miser, actually did a series of focus groups and talked with people who are caregivers and they tried to find caregivers at different stages of caregiving and these actual questions in their grief inventory come from what actual real caregivers said. And so um, let's look at these items so you get a, the hang of it. First one, I've had to give up a great deal to be a caregiver. And so then the caregiver would circle the number that represents how strongly they agree with that or how strongly they disagree from one to five. So if they feel like they've really had to give up an awful lot to be a caregiver, they'd probably circle a four or a five. And you'll notice there's a letter A at the end of that row. I'll talk about that later. Second one, I feel I'm losing my freedom. Well, for some people, at it, they may feel that they're losing their freedom, but for other people, they may not feel that as much. Um, and that might be because it's been uh, the person's in a m mild cognitive impairment, so the person is still able to function. Or maybe there's a lot of support, right? So the person with dementia may be further advanced, stages six, stage seven, but if the caregiver has a lot of support, they may not feel that they're losing their freedom to the same extent that they would feel without that support. Or also, maybe they've lived a life where they were um, very much involved with other people and other people's needs, and this isn't that big of a change. It's probably a big change, but compared to somebody who has never been in a caregiving role, uh, all right, then you have item three, I have nobody to communicate with. You see that's got a C at the end of the row. I have this empty, sick feeling knowing that my loved one is gone. This gets directly at ambiguous loss, right? Because this is a caregiver inventory you use before the person with dementia has died. So this is right in that transitional stage of the ambiguity. And so gone is put in quotes because, again, they're physically here, but the relationship is not the same, and it's not going to be the same. So that relationship is gone. Um, number five is spend a lot of time worrying about bad things to come. Number six, dementia is like a double loss. I've lost the closeness with my loved one and the connectedness with my family. All of these prompts could be used in a support group setting to give people permission to elaborate on how this prompt applies to them. My friends don't understand what I'm going through. Very, very common, um, as, especially if it's not an Alzheimer's. It's another kind of dementia. There's not a whole lot of public information about that. Um, so this is nine of the 18, and then I said there's a handout. What the developers of the caregiver inventory found is that there are three main factors or three main categories and that these questions tap and one is personal sacrifice burden. The other one is heartfelt sadness and longing and then worry and felt isolation. And so that's why at the end of each row you have a different letter there and then to determine a person's total grief level, you are going to add the scores for A, B, and C. But because of this, you're going to also be able to better understand what is this particular caregiver really focused on right now or what, where are they hurting right now or suffering or what kind of help might they need. So this indicates that there are six items on their scale of 18 items that were directly related to personal sacrifice burden. Those are all the A items. Then you add the score there. And so you'll see which of these three factors a particular caregiver might be struggling with um, right now, and then also a total grief score. You can use this in a research context. You can also use it in a clinical context. The authors make this uh, scale available. It's in the public domain. 
Um, they do ask that if you are going to use it for research, you let them know because they're trying to keep track of who's using it. And there's also a longer version. So those of you who might be interested in seeing the questions from a longer version, that's available too. But I really like this tool because it's built on the lived experience of people going through this ambiguous loss. And so these items should be ringing true to many people. That said, we have to remember, let's look back on these, that a person's culture is going to affect the extent to which they may recognize these role changes or may feel comfortable expressing them as negative. So I, this tool has not been thoroughly validated in different ethnic groups. So be mindful of that or different cultural groups, but it's definitely a very important start. Um, Maya Angelou gives us so many words of wisdom. I particularly like this quote. At times, each of us needs to withdraw from the cares which will not withdraw from us. So actually giving people social permission to step away from this intense caregiving situation making sure the person with dementia is safe, um, but also to take care of the caregiver. I touched a little bit about cultural awareness and sensitivity. This is a, uh, a big issue with any health issue, also with dementia and also with loss, and also with how people express the loss. These are these expectations, these understandings of the loss, understandings of the disease, understandings of the role changes are very much embedded in a cultural context. So individuals are going to be affected by the culture in which they are living or the culture in which they identify with. And in some cultures, you don't ever complain about caring for a parent. You know, cultures that are going to have more uh, higher levels of filial piety. Or in other cultures, um, it's not appropriate to talk about somebody having a dementia. So as you are working with your patients and clients, if there's um, people from a different cultural group that you're not that familiar with, it's important to understand what their expectations and experiences and beliefs are related to dementia related to grief, related to loss, bereavement, mourning, because they're going to vary. Um, we also need to recognize that many of the people that we're working with are being affected by ageism. That the kind of loss that they experience as a 70-year-old or an 80-year-old would be taken a lot more seriously if they were in their 20s or 30s. But society says, oh, well, they're older. Oh, they expected to decline. Lots and lots of ageism that uh, makes it harder to be coping with a dementia diagnosis. Um, ethnic differences and similarities, religious differences and similarities. And that's also why I wanted to mention that book by Irish Lundquist and Nelson. They talk about ways in which different cultures can look at these same concepts differently, but then they also recognize some of the universality. It's very difficult to do good work across culture if you are not really comfortable and able to identify your own culture and specifically what the influences are on you as a health practitioner related to your ideas of what it means for anyone to be diagnosed with dementia, um, your own experiences with loss and how you have coped with loss and how you consider appropriate or inappropriate ways of coping with loss, you will be able to serve your clients better if you're pretty grounded in your own approach to what dementia means to you or could mean to you, loss, things like that. And then it'll be easier for you to work with others. So we talked about the fast scale staging dementia. That would be an important tool that you can share with families because the stages are talked about in functional stages. Um, the loss awareness list is a starting off point. I think there could actually be a specific loss awareness list for people going through the ambiguous loss of dementia. Um, and that could be something you do in an in-service or with a support group. 
but that's a really good starting point. And then this Marwick Miser Caregiver Grief Inventory, specifically designed for caregivers um, taking care of somebody with dementia. Another very important source is the Alzheimer's Association, and we talked about that a little bit. Um, they have very reliable and good information. Um, the book by Pauline Boss, if you work with people with dementia, I strongly suggest that book. And then if you want to read a little bit more about this short version of the grief, Caregiver's Grief Inventory, there's a citation for that. They also um, have done other research for that longer version. So you've got the assessment scales. You know the importance of self-care for both the person with dementia, the caregivers of dementia, and also just a little reminder for you as a health professional, being around people experiencing this loss day in and day out will take a toll on you. So how are you taking care of yourself? Um, there's various different toolkits that are available uh, to assess bereavement um, after the death or looking at grief or looking at loss. Um, and then I strongly suggest for caregivers and persons with dementia that they recognize and know about support groups. We have support groups in person. We have support groups online. Some support groups are only for spouses. Other support groups are intergenerational. All There are ways that people can um, resist the isolation that this disease, this set of diseases can bring on. And it's so important for people experiencing the ambiguous loss of dementia. And try to be that rainbow in somebody else's cloud and recognize the importance of knowing when somebody has had a loss that that person would benefit from some extra attention with kid gloves. But if we don't articulate these losses and if people don't recognize or are able to express the losses, then it's highly unlikely that there's going to be a positive social response. And so in talking with your clients and patients and helping them build a vocabulary to talk about what they're going through and getting comfortable expressing their feelings and their um, fears with others will get that social support kicked in. We don't have the concrete event of a death, but we do have, we can use this concrete event of a diagnosis as the beginning of thinking about how do we provide support to these families and individuals. And frankly, more important than the health professionals providing the support is how do we connect with these people, with others who are going through the same experience so that they can develop a new and broadened network as they go through the ambiguous loss after the diagnosis of dementia.